example of common cold now if we do not treat any acute sinusitis it can lead to orbital cellulitis through a venous drainage which is passing through the veins which which has valvulus it can go up to the brain it can go to the orbit through a venous channel thrombophebitis and can give you orbital complications it can give you cranial complications leading to loss of vision it can give you a cavernous sinus thrombosis so it's very important to treat sinusitis in the acute phase with medication the initial way of treating a sinusitis is how we approach common cold you do uh, steam inhalations you use decongestants like xylomethazolin sprays which would what would it do would it would cause vasoconstriction and cause reduce in the inflammatory the mucosal thickness and cause patency of the ostium that would encourage drainage of the from the ostium second you use mucolytics like steam inhalations camphor menthol can inhalations can help in thinning out the secretions which are present into the sinus this thinning would allow it to pass out from the uh, from the ostium right when there is bacterial inflammation uh, invasion and you have purulency you have purulent discharges coming out from the nose mu mucus becomes thicker that is the time you need to start off with antibiotics and because antibiotics has a very uh, has negligible role in viral infection antibiotics only plays a role when there is bacterial superseded infection in a Uh, in a viral infection now when your medication does not work and the acute phase keeps on become sub acute and goes into chronicity that is the time we think about surgeries the first line of treatment is always medical when it becomes refractive to medical repeated medical interventions that is the time we have to go in and try to get back the normal physiology of the sinus the environment of a healthy sinus should be regained and that is how we go in with surgeries to get that environment back there are various surgery options which are available ranging from cadaver loop surgical drainage functional endoscopic maxillary sinus surgeries you can do a balloon sinus procedure as well so that is all about sinusitis now apart from bacterial viral what we see is fungal invasion as well we see fungal rhino sinusitis you see a way uh, you can see it in the acute phase as well and most commonly they are seen in a chronic rhino sinusitis fungal tends to be invasive or it can be non non invasive most common fungi present in the sinus could be mucor aspergillus candidiasis rhizophus these are the common uh, fungal infections which can take place in the sinus now normally they are non invasive they tend to be there present according to the environment but when do they proliferate when do they really cause uh, symptoms signs and symptom in a healthy sinus is when the patients with fungal are most mostly if you see those patient are immuno compromised patients patient may have diabetes they have chronic alcoholism autoimmune diseases systemic steroid therapies they may have on uh, immunosuppressant uh, uh, medications transplantations aids these are the patient the systemic conditions uh, pushes them towards fungal rhino sinusitis non invasive uh, fungal infections normally tend to show up as a fungal ball or a just erosion erosive with muco uh, serous secretions into the sinus but invasive are the ones which are most aggressive in nature now if you see a clinical picture which has been kept is a aggressive uh, mucomycosis picture 
where there is necrosis of the maxillary bone and you can see the type of uh, invasion in this ct scan it can start eroding the vital the nasal pores the alveolus and it is very aggressive in nature now i came across a condition uh, one patient was referred to me now that uh, dentist uh, how the patient came up to that dentist and he said he gave me a call and he said that was uh, they say uh, there is a lot of calculus in the maxilla which is not coming out and i said was you click your uh, clinical photographs and send it to me and he referred that patient to me and when i examined that patient it was not calculus but it was necros bone which was mobile the entire maxillary arch on the affected side was mobile it was just osteomyelitis of a uh, fungal origin we took uh, now this patient had uh, after a few days he did go back after that and he said i'll come after a few days after a few days he had orbital uh, involvement he lost his eye in a few weeks time and he after that he came again and he had symptoms on the opposite side as well and he was really uh, it was a very aggressive nature he was he didn't know he was very confused after losing his eyesight and he was referred to a higher center after that because we saw on the ct scan it had involved his orbit it had in, uh, it had infiltrated into the infratemporal fossa as well and uh, the oral cavity as well so it was quite a aggressive lesion in just a matter of 10 days in my observation and a little more previous to that so it's that uh, aggressive in nature now when we see such cases what do we do with it? well it is debridement if you have a small fungal ball you go in locally through a cadaver look uh, sorry something went wrong Can somebody help me with this? There's a okay. Let's ignore this. Okay. Sorry. I hope again I'm live. The slides are clear. and my audio as well uh, yes sir when, it's clear okay so when we have such fungal aggressive uh, conditions or a uh, mild form if it's just a fungal ball you can go in through a cadaver look approach start the patient on antifungal treatment and you can go in and clear the sinus debridement is very important when it comes to mild forms aggressive the necros bone everything has to be removed till you get healthy margins healthy bone around it and you should put the patient on systemic antifungals sometimes you may have to put the patients on hyperbaric oxygen treatments orbital extraction may be required and if orbital involvements you may have to give transcutaneous retrobulbar injections of the antifungal uh, drug as well so that's a photograph which shows a necros maxilla which has to be removed for getting control over the aggressive form of fungal sinusitis now apart from infections we tend to see cysts and tumors as well most common cysts are odontogenic in origin because of the close approximation of the dental arches apart from that you can have local cysts and tumors of the uh, sinus itself as well now most common of our interest are periapical cysts in relation to 
molars or premolars they can enlarge and start invading into the uh, sinus areas as well residual cyst dentigerous cyst most commonly with the impacted third molars or canine can invade into the sinus odontogenic keratocyst have been reported where it is involving the entire of the uh, maxillary sinus you can also see innocent mucosal enteral cyst inside the uh, uh, sinus cavities like this a small uh, dome of a radio opaque structure very well defined in the sinus lining what do we do with that how do we treat we do our clinical examination we do our x rays we come to a diagnosis and then we can either depending on the surgical plan we can go in for surgical enucleation or marsupialization of those small cyst benign tumors benign tumors ranging from benign to malignant it can be an osteoma it could be a amyloblastoma as seen in the ct scans if you see a benign tumor you come to a diagnosis after your clinical examination how do we go about treating it we go in and resect the part of the tumor either a maxillectomy uh, a sub maxillectomy a partial or a total maxillectomy depending on the uh, tumor and its ag aggressiveness malignant tumors though it's beyond the scope of this lecture it would give you signs as similar as a chronic sinusitis foul discharges from the sinus it can invade into the sinus uh, into the oral cavity it could er erode into the orbital the posterior maxillary infratemporal region it can give you epitaxis heaviness and uh, invasiveness is much more uh, giving you signs and symptoms accordingly now very important for post graduation is this ogren's line which is a imaginary line uh, drawn from the medial canthus to the angle of the mandible the sinus is divided into two halves the anterior inferior part and the posterior superior part it gives you the prognosis and the aggressiveness of this uh, lesions anterior inferior are ones which are early detected the posterior superior ones are more aggressive and uh, has are uh, tend to be hidden more and they are more invasive into the infratemporal and the orbital region the prognosis is are bad in posterior superior uh, compartment uh, malignant tumors as well those are again taken up by weber ferguson incisions maxillectomies reconstructions and radical neck dissections accordingly next would be foreign bodies in the entrum this takes up the uh vast majority of the cases which we see uh because of the anatomical relation of the maxillary sinus with the dental arches we tend to see if we try to understand the floor of the sinus is very uh, closely related to the premolars the molars and the impacted third molars while treating any of this teeth we are most likely in approximation to the sinuses most common um, are foreign bodies which escapes into the sinus are the palatal roots which we can find into the sinus how do we go we'll go into the, uh, in detail when we take up oral enteral communications palatal root escapes inside while doing surgeries for the th impacted third molars uh, we normally if not careful or instrumentation or the anatomy of the third molars as such that they makes it more uh, likely to get escaped into the sinus the conical root morphology of a root very closely related with a very thin bone uh, in between if you remember uh, impaction classification for third molars it is also given in approximation to the sinuses so that is the more uh, importance of those relation is that important you can find traumatic uh, fragments by a bullet missile injury you can find those inside the sinuses people play around with matchsticks 
wooden spheres can be also foreign objects glass pieces plastic metals can be also found traumatically involving the maxillary sinus we can have, there are cases reported of impression materials dental implants graft materials escaping into the sinus even birds have been reported endodontic files and materials we before this uh, covid lockdown we had a endodontic file which was in relation to the sinus we did uh, remove that uh, from the sinus so anything and everything is possible from a dental's point of view so there is no surprises what we can find inside the sinus so there are few x rays which have been kept which shows a, a dental implant in the sinus there is a, a bone graft in this relation you see endodontic uh, uh, your, um, material which have been pushed into the sinus there is a root piece here high up now sometimes we can imagine how does this happen gravitational forces how does this fellow go up high up there is a beautiful uh, article on that which says that the ciliary movement is so beautiful that if you observe over a period of time there is a moment of uh, a root piece has been observed to move move from one segment which was observed a few days back has changed its location by the ciliary movement and can go and it tends to push it off from the ostium bone graft materials been pushed out in the lateral wall of the nose the root piece is also been pushed out now what happens do we need to wait for that to happen from this depending on the size of the foreign object also ostium tends to allow it to go out but there is a complication which can happen like aspiration of that graft material or a root piece which has been pushed into the nasal cavity that can lead to pneumonia and aspiration pneumonias and all, all that so it is better to intervene and get it out through a surgery so when you find foreign bodies those if left inside could lead to chronic maxillary sinusitis and as i mentioned inhalation uh, aspiration pneumonias and all that management through you tend to somehow approach the sinus i whichever uh, approaches you want to use whichever is feasible clinically and expertise you can go through a socket you can go through a cadaver looks approach you can go in from a endoscopic approach the idea behind all this approaches get that damn thing out of the sinus now now that we know what all things we can find in that wall in that maxillary sinus what do we do next should we go in and start treating it no first we need to understand what that vault is what is that sinus which we are going to be dealing with we need to understand the basic anatomy as my father always says there is no surgery without anatomy first of all we need to understand the anatomy first of the surgical area which we are dealing with we have to come up with a plan and then follow it with a surgery so anatomy surgical plan and then surgery is the way we should approach uh, any conditions now anatomy if we look into maxillary sinus everybody knows everybody has studied i'll just refresh it from a surgical point of view uh enter it is known as the entrails of entrail of hymore which was given uh, the term coined by natalis hymore in 1651 a derivative of a first pharyngeal arch starts embryological in the fourth month of intrauterine life by invagination of the endomid endoderm into the maxilla and it completes the uh, growth by the age of 18 now in between it has two growth spurts if you see in this diagram it tends to slowly invaginate into the maxilla 5 to 
seven years is the first growth spurt where we see a, a increase in the growth rate. And second is from around the 12 to 15 years. If you see a, a kid of nine years, you have 60% of the growth of the uh, sinus which has taken place. At the age of 12, the sinus is at the floor parallel to the, the floor of the sinus is parallel to the floor of the uh, nose. Now, why I'm going into embryology is children below the age of 15 are less likely to have oroenteral fistulas while you do any dental uh, extractions or any dental procedures which are likely to cause fistulas less likely to be seen in children below the age of 15. Second significance is if you are planning to do a enteral surgical drainage of, of the entrum, you have to keep it in mind the age of the patient. You cannot do an inferior uh, enteral surgical lavage in a, a small kid of a 9, 10 years old. Right, so you, you uh, the floor is high up, and you cannot have that at that time. You have to think about a middle turbinate, mid, a middle meatus entrostomy, or a excess from the middle meatus in, in children. It is pyramidal in shape, as you see, the base of the pyramid is towards the lateral wall of the nose, the apex is in towards the zygoma, zygomatic bone, the four surfaces. The anterior surface is, uh, it has a roof, it has an anterior surface, it has a floor which is towards the alveolus, roof at the orbital rim, the orbital floor, and the lateral surface, the posterior surface is towards the intraorbital uh, region. So those are the four uh, surfaces of the uh, maxillary sinus. Here from a cross section, you can see the posterior uh, relations, the anterior relation of the maxilla, the roof, the orbit, and the dental arches. On the lateral wall, which is the medial wall of the sinus, opens into the lateral wall of the nose. You can see an ostium that is the only communication in a maxillary sinus. Now, what are the sinus uh, dimensions? Now, if we see anterior posterior, it is about 3.5 centimeter. If you see the height, it is around 3.2 centimeters, which is given by Turner. And you have a 2.5 centimeter width of the sinus. Now, that's the relation of the uh, medial wall with the lateral wall of the nose. It tends to open up, the ostium tends to open up in, on the lateral wall of the nose. It opens up in the uh, hiatus semilunaris in the middle meatus. Now, it is when very important to understand the anatomy of the lateral wall of the nose when it comes to endoscopy. When, if you are planning to do uh, functional endoscopic uh, sinus surgeries, it is very important you know the uh, sinus openings and the relation of the inferior turbinates, the middle uh, turbinate, the middle meatus, the superior uh, turbinates and the recess, their openings, their relations, the anatomical arteries, nerves in relation to this because it's a very vascular and it has uh, arterial supply from the internal carotid as well as the external carotid. It's very vascular. You need to understand that before we go in with a functional endoscopy procedure. So the maxillary opening has along with it an interior and the middle ethmoidal sinus openings as well. Uh, if you see in the superior meatus, you have a frontal and uh, sorry, the spinoidal recess. Above the superior meatus, you have a spinoidal sinus opening and you have a posterior ethmoidal opening on this. The anterior to the uh, semilunaris, you have a frontal sinus opening. So you in the middle meatus, you have the frontal, you have the anterior and the middle ethmoidal, as well as the maxillary sinus openings. If you go into the inferior meatus, you have a nasolacrimal duct opening in the anterior region. 
this is a very important structure when we are thinking about surgical drainage through the interior uh, meatus as well as this duct travels from the orbit to the nose when we are trying to do an entrostomy in the middle meatus when we are enlarging the entrostomy we should never go anterior anterior while making the entrostomy because we are more likely to damage the nasal nacrimal duct so that's with the lateral wall of nose the arterial supply of the maxillary sinus comes from the maxillary artery the facial artery the infraorbital and the greater palatine vessels tends to uh, supply the blood supply to the sinus second the veins tends to follow the same vessels uh, is through the facial vein um, uh, facial veins and the maxillary vein they tend to drain into the facial vein and the pterygoid plexus now why this is important is it has a direct access uh, drainage into the cavernous sinus thrombosis the dangerous area of the nose uh, of the face if you see the first if you remember that triangle the maxillary sinus the nasal cavity the ethmoidal sinuses all come into the dangerous zone the nerve supply maxillary nerve the infraorbital branches the posterior superior the middle uh, superior the anterior superior branches all supply the uh, maxillary sinus now very important is this plexus of dental plexus of the posterior middle and the anterior which communicates with each other second is the anterior superior uh, branch which gives 15 mm from the infraorbital opening 15 mm mm behind and it travels on the anterior surface of the maxilla uh, wall of the maxillary sinus now this is the area where the cavernal loop approach entrostomy we do so most likely when we do the complication is anesthesia paresthesia of the canines the premolar uh, teeth and sometimes we can damage the intraorbital nerves as well so the anatomy is very important while we are planning our surgeries second if we go behind is the relation of the dental the mo most common uh first tooth closely approximated to the floor is your second maxillary molar followed by uh the first molar the third molar impacted third molars followed by the second premolar and the first molar and your lastly is your canine sometimes the pneumatization as it progresses tends to go as closer to this dental structures sometimes we see invagination of the maxillary sinus in between the roots of this so periapical uh, x-rays and evaluation is very mandatory when we are planning extractions of this or endodontic treatments of this teeth now cinderium membrane the lining which uh, lines this maxillary sinus is of utter importance because one it has it is a, different to what is oral mucosa one it is a pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium it is a similar epithelium which is a respiratory type now if we tend to understand the lining it is ciliated it has micro cilia present on the surfaces of the epithelium this is very much uh, needed for the clearance of the uh, mucosa out of the ostium this function is important important in draining the sinus into the lateral wall of the nose second the globular cells the submucosal glands tend to produce mucosa and the serous part of the uh, secretions of the maxillary sinus there are two forms the gel form and the sole form sole form is very important for which is at the bottom of the lining for the cilia beating one and the mucus uh, layer that is the gel state is very important for trapping of the bacteria impurities dirt bacteria whatever we inhale tends to get entrapped into this uh, gel state and is being 
drawn out of the sinus. Now this is just one or two mm of thickness. Very thin. What we play around with uh, implant surgeries while doing our sinus lifts is just two mm of uh, lining. It's very thin, but it is resilient. If it has an elasticity of 1.32% elasticity, you can stretch it to an extent. Sometimes I surprise uh, when some people on Facebook and WhatsApp, they tend to show us 10, 10 mm of uh, crustal uh, bone formations uh, from the sinus floors. It's, uh, it's very difficult to see 10, 10 mm. You can see 5 mm or so with a elasticity of 1.32% uh, percent of elasticity. If the forces are high, if you don't gently stretch it, it can result in perforation. Most common complication of a implant surgery, sinus lifts are perforations. And then it makes that complication of a sinus perforation, lining perforation can 